<laughs> Good morning and happy Sabbath. As most of you know, uh, I was working with AFM, Adventist Frontier Missionaries, this last year in Cambodia. Um, and I worked among the Cham people, which is a minority Muslim people group. But before I start speaking, I want to invite my mother up here to uh, give an illustration to you guys about uh, mission giving. We need 10 volunteers. Yeah. Allie, do you want to come up? Can everybody hear me now? Okay. All right, as you can see up here on the stage, I have 10 bottles of water. The water in, in the Bible, what is water? The river of life, right? It is Christ, okay? It's the, it represents the gospel, okay? This is the gospel and all the resources that it takes to get that gospel out there, okay? So we're going to have Noreen over here. Noreen is going to represent all of the English-speaking people in the world. There are about 372 million English-speaking people in the world that, that English is their native tongue. It is their first language, which is about 5.1% of the population only. Another 8% actually know English as a second language, so that is up to about 13. So we're just going to say she's one-tenth of the population, okay? She's one-tenth of the population that can be reached in English, all right? Then we have Will here who speaks German by birth, but we're going to pretend he's Spanish, okay? So he's going he's to represent all the Spanish-speaking people of the world, okay? And then there's... Melissa, we'll, we'll say that she's, you know, another big chunk of the world uh, is from China, okay? So we have Mandarin, Chinese, Cantonese, okay? So then, and, and then all of these people are going to represent other portions, other tenths of the world, okay, with all their different languages. So I have 10 bottles, each representing 10% of what we can take the gospel to these people, to these whole world here. Okay, the whole world is represented. So I'm going to give this tenth to the English-speaking people. Okay, this is this is how it is in the world right now. From our church, from our church. Okay, this is the gospel. So this this tenth. Gonna go to her. No, 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 no. You hold it. You go. Yep. And this tenth. Gonna go to her. And this tenth. Let's see. Um, no, oh, it goes to you. Let's see what this tenth. Let's see. Oh, no, this tenth. It goes to you. And let's see. This tenth goes to you. And this tenth goes to you. And this tenth, yep, it goes to you. And this tenth, yep, 
goes to you. What do you think? Is that the way it should be? Not over 90% of our resources for spreading the gospel go to the people in English-speaking areas. And the rest of them get to share this. I can tell Noreen wants to share. Do you want to share? It's just a really good illustration to let you understand that we have a lot of unreached people out there that don't speak English, that have no way to hear the gospel and no resources that are being spent on them to be able to hear the gospel in their native tongue and understand the saving message that we enjoy and have the privilege and freedom of knowing. Something to think about. Thank you guys for your help. I'd like to have a word, word of prayer. Wait for everybody to sit down. Okay, let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, I just thank you for the Sabbath day and being able to come and uh, be in the Mile City Church again. It's, it's nice to be home to visit. And Lord, I ask that your spirit would be in this church, Lord, that uh, you would bless the people here and that they might know you and they may uh, know your love in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So this year, uh, living as one of the only missionaries uh, in my area and the only missionary in the village that I worked in, uh, I had uh, to go straight to the Bible for any uh, education on what I should do when I came across uh, different problems or, or, or stumbling blocks where I couldn't reach people or I didn't know what I was supposed to do. So I want to share with you first... Uh, a story for the Bible that uh, started to speak to me, and it's a it's the story of uh, Naomi and Ruth, and Naomi's family, and I want to share what it uh, taught me recently. I do want to open our Bibles to uh, Ruth chapter one, verses one through five, so we can read that. Ruth chapter one, verses one through five. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the name of his two sons Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab, and the name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. I want to share with you that I looked up what Naomi's name meant. And Naomi's name means pleasantness. So she came out of a land that was quite pleasant, uh, but it had a spiritual famine. They weren't bringing in any harvest, and her and her family could no longer live there. They couldn't, they couldn't support themselves there. And uh, for me, this compared to the church where you're in a church and it's, it's easy to be in a church. It's easy to come. It's easy to uh, join in on the fellowship. But when the church is spiritually dead, the church does lose its appeal. And you're not being fed and nobody's coming in. There's no harvest coming in. There's no work being done because there's no harvest. It's, it's, it's a famine in the land. 
But Naomi and her family, they left their country and they went where there was a need for a harvest. They went searching for a land that had a need and then they worked there. But Naomi's family, um, they lost pretty much everything. Or she lost everything. She lost her husband first and then she lost her kids. And when it was time for her to return to her home, she only had two, two followers. She had Orpa, whose name actually uh, means stiff-necked. And Orpa wasn't ready to come out of what she knew. She, was, she wanted to be culturally the same as she was before. She, she missed her people, and she wasn't ready to turn her back and go completely into the new land. And then there was Ruth, who is, um, the meaning for her name is companion or friend. And Ruth saw in Naomi something that she wanted. When Naomi returned um, to Israel, she told her friends that they should call her Mara. They should change her name from pleasantness to bitterness and sorrow. She had a, she had a burden. She'd, she'd gone out and given her life and her youth and her family for something that uh, took it away. And she came back with a young girl who as of yet didn't know Jesus. But she saw something in Naomi, even in Naomi's sorrow, that she wanted. And I think she saw that Naomi was completely surrendered to what God wanted, even if it broke her. And then after that, Ruth went and she started working for Boaz, who was a type of Christ. And Boaz told her that she did a good work. And Naomi's friends told her that she had a great blessing because she had a daughter who was worth more than seven sons. And that daughter produced the line that would lead to Jesus, who was to save the entire world. So while Naomi only saw one, even though she was surrendered and she was out there working, and she gave her time and her energy to go live with the people that, um, that were different than her, or who didn't believe the same as her, her inheritance became the entire world through Jesus Christ. So this last year, I went to Cambodia because this is where I was called to go. Everybody's called to a different place, and sometimes you're just called across the street. But um, most of you I know, I shared about my dream before, and I was very clearly led to go to Cambodia. And last time I was in Cambodia, uh, a couple years ago, there was um, a murder. And one of our students' older brothers, who had not uh, accepted Christ, um, he was just uh, murdered on the side of the road. And we were invited to the funeral, and we went there, and it was a Buddhist funeral, and people were howling and mourning, and they had absolutely no hope. Uh, they were doing anything they could to keep the demons from coming back to their house. And they were, there was just fear and sorrow and sadness. And while we look at it, for us, some of it's ridiculous. It's something that's very real to them. And I could see their fear and their sorrow. And I knew that I wanted to share with people who'd never heard about Jesus. So this last year, I was able to return with AFM. And I was supposed to go straight to... Um, like a really rural village, and teach English classes. That was what I signed up for. And when I got there, some stuff changed, and things weren't ready and things weren't set up. 
So I ended up having the opportunity of going to Phnom Penh, the capital, and doing an intensive language learning course. So I went and learned Khmer for two months, and while I was in the capital, I was also able to visit uh, the Adventist mission, Adra, uh, a bunch of Adventist schools. The majority of the Adventist schools in Cambodia are inside of Phnom Penh or just outside of Phnom Penh. And I was able to ask them questions, how their ministries ran, how they got set up, um, what they used for their curriculum, what their mission focus was. And I was also able to visit the government ministries, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Commerce, um, the Ministry for Labor, and I was able to ask them questions of how it worked for foreigners to set things up, how it worked um, for taxes and the laws and the legal system, and I got a lot of knowledge about this, and I wanted to take it back and utilize it, which we were able to, which was very nice. But after all of this and being in the city, uh, it was finally time for me to return to the village to start teaching. The village that I went to had been asking for a teacher to some of the other missionaries who lived about uh, half an hour away. And they'd asked for somebody to come and teach English. I'd visited them with the other missionaries and we told them that we'd need a place for me to live while I was in the village because I, I didn't want to be traveling back at night on the highways. So between the time that I went to Phnom Penh and the time I came back to the village, they had already gone to the chief of the village. Uh, they'd asked for permission for me to come and live. You can't live there without permission. They'd um, made it possible for me to teach inside the Muslim school and they had a family who was going to take me in and house me um, for the time that I lived there. So I started teaching, and we went in the village. There was nothing really set up, so I, I went in and I said, okay, we're going to teach a class at 5 o'clock. Let everybody know. <laughs> And word of mouth is really the way to get things done around there. If you tell somebody and you, you say share, it, it goes around within a couple hours. And I had a lot of kids that night, so we ended up having to split it into three classes. I had one class in the morning for the, for the oldest students, uh, young adults who were no longer in school, and adults the Chan teachers actually ended up coming to the morning class a number of times. And then in the evening, I split it between uh, younger children and the older children. Aside from teaching English, uh, I just lived with them uh, a lot of the time. And I did what they did. I tried to help where I could. It takes a bit of learning to... <laughs> to be very helpful, but I tried, and I visited with people. And then we also did some medical visits. So um, there was a Christian hospital that we could send people to if necessary, but in the village we also did medical missionary work. We used hot and cold, charcoal, uh, telling them to drink water is incredibly important. People have like chronic bladder infections and stuff just because they don't drink enough water. And so we did that on a daily basis. And then the family that I lived with, the two parents have accepted Christ. And then their aunt accepted Christ. And the aunt's, um, their cousins, husband and wife, accepted Christ. None of them have been baptized as of yet but they have accepted Christ. But I ask that you pray for their children who are uh, 19 and 11. And while the 11-year-old is interested in the studying and stuff that goes on, uh, the 19-year-old is very much afraid to sin. Um, in the Muslim culture, they have a lot of fear. So she's afraid to not continue um, in the 
everyday prayers and such uh, that Muslims have. This man's name is uh, Hu Emron, or Uncle Emron. And he is actually the man who went to the chief, and went to the school, and prepared the way for me to come into the community. I didn't know that he was the one that did this until a month or two after I was living in the village. But he was also the one who, whenever I was sick, um, or there was something going on that people wanted to invite me to, he'd make sure that I understood what was going on, and he'd come and visit and check. And he also had questions about what I believed. And so I ended up having a lot of spiritual conversations with him and also learning from him about his own culture and language and what they believe. But as I shared with him and his family, I noticed that there was absolutely nothing I could do to convince them that they should study it out for themselves because they believed everything that was taught to them and they had such faith in what they believed that they didn't even realize their need to study what was in their own, their own Quran or in the Bible. They'd never really done it, they'd never been taught to do it, and so they just didn't. And this started to bother me and there was absolutely nothing I could do to share anything else with them. So I started praying and the verse that came to mind when I was praying is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 5, which reads, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might rest on human, not on human wisdom, but on God's power. And so after this, I decided that I needed to let God fight this battle because it really wasn't something that I could do. And I was praying, and I still felt that they needed a daily... Um, ounce of the Holy Spirit in their lives. They needed to be in God's present presence to really hear him speaking. And for my situation, I felt led to go and anoint their mosque. So I took uh, some oil and I went to their mosque in front of the doors and I put the oil on the doors and then I prayed. And I was standing there in the middle of the afternoon, and I was praying that God would bind Satan from that place and that his Holy Spirit and his angels would minister there. So when those men and women came five times a day to pray, and when they were seeking God, and they were, they were truly desiring to do what's right, that Jesus would be there and that he would be who they were looking to when they were praying, and that he would be um, responding to them. So now this mosque in their area belongs to Jesus. And recent, a recent uh, Sabbath, I, I got news that there were nine people at church. And for the past 10 years, this project had one baptism and very few uh, people coming to their, their uh, worships on Sabbath. But they had nine people come, and Pu Emron was one of them. This community, uh, the moms have asked for Christian school or Christian teachings. And They've asked for their kids to be able to learn about Jesus. They don't know how to seek it out, but they're asking. And uh, the lady that I lived with, she came to me uh, one night. I think she must have seen that I was discouraged or the Holy Spirit prompted her to come and talk to me.
because she told me that the people out there were talking about me. And they were talking about the other missionaries who came to visit occasionally. And they were saying that our religion was good. We also learned um, through the one baptized Cham member that this village of over 300 families uh, has recently been arguing and about half of them have threatened to leave uh, Islam and convert to Christianity uh, because they see things that they're not liking. So please keep this village in your prayers. Uh, keep these people in your prayers. Uh, it's hard for them to go one at a time because they do, in a way, get sort of shunned. But there's a lot of them talking and a lot of them are interested. And a lot of them don't understand the complete difference between what they believe and what Christians believe. But what they really don't understand is uh, God's grace and God's love. I can give you an example of the fear that they grow up with. Uh, it's, a, it's a country that has a lot of fear anyway because of the war and the government and everything that's gone on since. There's, there's constant threats on their life and their livelihoods. But the little girls who uh, their parents want them to learn to wear their head covering, they're told, and their parents actually believe this, um, that when they die, any of the hair that they were showing will turn to snakes, and it'll bite them uh, when they're resurrected. So they live with this, this constant fear, and there's lots of things that, that are fear-based, that they need to know the love and the truth that uh, we have. Uh, this is an example. This is a map that shows uh, the population of the world that is Christian, uh, depending on zone. The lightest is between 1% and 5%. It doesn't show up well on the screen. But it's, it's Asia and Middle East, some of Africa, has bet only between 1% and 5% Christian. And some of those countries have less than 1%. And then the people, this is population density. So you have most of the people who are living, most of the people of the world are living in Asia, that area, and that's where the, the least people know about Jesus. There's actually four, four and a half billion in Asia people out of seven and a half billion in the world. And yet, as, as we know, it's called the 1040 window, that's what we call it. But uh, very, very few people over there are even um, exposed to Christianity or Jesus. So, now I can share what our project is for this next year. <laughs> I'm actually going to be working with uh, Jesus for Asia, which is a ministry uh, who works in Southeast Asia and, and, and in India. But they have uh, different schools. They, have, they do medical work. They do media ministry, um, translating and videos uh, for native speakers, um, among other things. And we're partnering with them and the Cambodia Adventist Mission to build a boarding academy. The boarding academy will be for 7th through 10th, or 7th through 12th grade. We need to have seventh grade because there's a lot of Adventist schools who only go through sixth grade. And these Adventist schools that only go through sixth grade, are most of them are teaching in Khmer. They're not teaching in English. So these students that are graduating from their sixth grade schools don't have any past experience in English. So to go on to um, the English Adventist schools um, is very difficult or impossible. So this will be the, the, the first uh, large-scale Adventist mission boarding academy that's completely in Khmer and uh, provides schooling for 7th through 12th grade. We do want this uh, school to be done uh, by the blueprint of Ellen White. We want to do it according to Ellen White standards not the world standards. So there will be work education 
We'd like it to be self-supporting. Eventually, some of the ideas for self-supporting are organic uh, agriculture. This is actually something that is necessary in Cambodia. They have a lot of their food is imported from other countries, um, especially from Vietnam. There's a lot of chemicals put into the food, so much so that people are visibly getting sick, and they know where it comes from. It's, it's not like the problems we have here with chemicals. It's, it's much worse. And so people are wanting organic or uh, non-chemical foods. Another idea we're thinking about is a silk, a silk farm. Uh, silk is a big thing over there, and uh, we're looking into the cost effectiveness of that. But the students will be able to come if they can't afford tuition. They'll be able to have a work, uh, work schedule. Every student will work, but um, they'll be able to help support the school to put themselves through school. We also want their learning to be student-centered. We don't uh, we don't want to just teach them what we think they need to know. We want to ask students and learn from them what they can take with them and what's most important to them to learn. There's a lot of people who uh, share this stream. The Cambodia Adventist Mission is one of them. Uh, MC Shin is a Korean missionary who I'll be working with. And Tim Maddox, who has a fully functioning uh, school and orphanage and media center is also behind this project and working closely with the mission to help us uh, be successful in this goal. But Ellen White has a quote here that uh, really spurred us to, to go with this project and um, for JFA to take on this project. It says, if the ensign of truth can be lifted in educational institutions and in sanitariums for the sick, in the islands of the sea and in many countries, more would be accomplished in bringing souls to the truth than can be accomplished by all other methods that can be devised. And I can testify that the two things that people ask for over there from us that they can't get for themselves are medical care and an education. And this is what people need, so it's definitely an open door into their hearts and into their lives. This is the land that we're looking at in Badenbong um, that we'd like to purchase to build the school. We're, our goal right now is $100,000 for the land. This will get us uh, over 100 acres, hopefully. This land will be used for the high school, but will probably also be used for the Cambodia um, project where they want to start a, a Bible college, Bible university. That will, um, they want to teach pastors and teachers and health workers um, so that they can be effective in their own language and in their own country. Uh, our second fund that we have is for a vehicle. Um, and we're hoping to be able to purchase a vehicle uh, for about $17,000. We have, uh, currently, we've raised... 7,500 for the Adventist vehicle, and we have had a, a donor who's willing to match up to 5,000. So if we can reach the 5,000 before October 15th, then we'll have reached our goal uh, and be able to buy a vehicle for the school project and to help with medical um, runs and other things. Uh, for the land, I should add that we have 20% of our goal so far. So we're on our way. <laughs> The other thing I would like to share is that I am one missionary, but there's also uh, Will. This is Will, and he's from Germany. And he's worked as a missionary for the last three years, um, mostly in, in Europe and Africa. But he went to AFM training with me. And when I was um, getting ready to come back to do fundraising, I was thinking about um, getting a sending out letters to people that I knew who were young people who were interested in missions um, who would be willing to come and help with this project because uh, there's a lot to do. <laughs> and I sent out six letters, and he's the one that responded. So 
both of us will be going back and working with the family that's already there. And we're just praying for um, stipend funds. So keep that in your prayers for our living expenses, but also for the, that this will be part of the money that's available for medical work that we can do, or sending people to the hospitals and uh, travel, like gas. So um, keep that in your prayers. Keep the other uh, funds in your prayers. But also keep, keep the future students in your prayers and the future staff for this school, um, that God would lead the right people and the right kids at the right time so that they could get to know him and uh, be part of his work, but also um, be able to meet all of us in heaven. And also pray that we have more missionaries. Uh, Pastor Diego pointed out last night um, when, uh, at our Vespers service that Christ came here to dwell among us. And in Cambodia, I know all the missionaries are very, very lonely. There's very few of them. And there's so many people. There are 16 million people in Cambodia. And there are only 2,000 Adventists in the country. There are 12 pastors in the whole country. And Christ came in to live with us and then asked us to do likewise. So whether it's here in your community, reaching out with other people, being, um, being friends with people here or overseas, just continue to pray for the people who are working. Because there's a, there's a great controversy going on and God's already won, but it would be wonderful if we could be a part of it. Let's pray. Dear Lord, um, just come into our hearts, Lord, and help us to carry a blessing with you through the next week. Uh, we thank you for the Sabbath rest that you've given us, Lord, and we just continue to ask that you would be with Mile City here, Lord, and um, that we may be able to, to reach people for Christ, for heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.